Well, thanks everybody for coming here. Um, my name is Adrian Cockcroft, and um, I was a, a, a hero last year, a community hero, and they gave us these gold jackets. So I decided I needed to do my Liberace impression to, to introduce everyone here. Um, might keep me warm anyway. Um, so, last year I, I was a, a customer. And I, about a few months ago, I joined AWS. Uh, I'm based in, in the Bay Area. I'm a VP for Cloud Architecture Strategy. Um, I'm still figuring out exactly what that means, but it seems to give me some, some license to do some things. In particular, the area that I'm working on first is around open source. So I'm very happy to be introducing the open source community track here. And I'm also doing a talk on Thursday afternoon at 3.30 uh, on open source, you know, what AWS is doing in open source, what we've done up to this point, and start the conversation on a much larger investment in open source, more outbound. Um, I had one person so far, but we're going to build a team to go engage with the open source communities. Um, so far, the teams at AWS have mostly concentrated on consuming open source and you know, building engineering products around it, but we're going to be doing a lot more outbound. So I'll talk to you more about that on Thursday, but uh, I'd like to set up, get this session underway. So I have one click. Um, we have three speakers this afternoon. Uh, Nadia Egbal from GitHub, who will be up first, Austin Collins from Serverless, and Andy Glover from Netflix. So let's get started and welcome uh, Nadia up on stage. Thank you. Hey, everyone. I'm Nadia. Um, I work on open source community programs at GitHub. And I thought I would kick off this session by talking about best practices for new open source projects. Uh, we see a lot of open source projects at GitHub, obviously. And what's interesting is, regardless of the language or the ecosystem or the type of project, um, the process for running a project successfully is actually pretty similar across projects. Um, so I thought I would dive into that. I'm going to spend the first part talking about why best practices even matter in the context of running an open source project. Why do we even care about kind of establishing these standard practices? And then I'm going to dive into some of the specific strategies. So first off, why start an open source project in the first place? Um, a lot of different reasons why people open source their work. These are just a couple of them. Um, you might be interested in making your code transparent, especially for security reasons. Um, you might be interested in collaborating with other people on your software project from around the world. You might be interested in building a new ecosystem, um, because open sourcing a project can often lead to better adoption from developers. So a lot of different reasons. Um, the process for starting an open source project, regardless of the reason, is pretty similar. And you might find that you're writing all this code, and then you flip the switch, and you make it open source, you make it public. Um, and in the beginning, it's all about writing the code. But as your project grows, you're going to find that what your community needs from you and what the project needs from you is going to be more than just code. So your users are going to need things like tutorials, examples, documentation to get started. They're going to need a roadmap that communicates what your priorities are for developing the project. And they're going to expect a timely response. Um, if they file a bug, or they open an issue, or they have a question, they're expecting that there's someone on the other end who's providing support. And so if you're thinking that it's an open source project, I'll just get my contributors to do all this work for me, think again, um, because your contributors need a lot of stuff from you, too. So if someone contributes code back to your project, someone needs to be reviewing that code, um, requesting changes, merging it back into the project. They're going to want feedback if they have crazy new ideas that you haven't even thought about for your project. Um, they're going to want to talk it through with you. Um, you're going to have a large issue backlog that someone needs to organize and take care of. And regular contributors are also probably looking for formal contribution or formal recognition. Um, so you're going to have to think about, how do I get outside contrib contributors brought into my process? So there's a lot of things here. Um, none of it has to do with you writing code, but it has to do with you managing your community and managing the actual project. So how do we make this stuff easier? I'm um, going to focus on a couple different things. Um, you'll probably see that good documentation and clear communication are two really big themes throughout, but I'll break it down a little bit more. 
Um, so first area is just around structurally, what can you do to set your project up to be successful? If you're starting a new open source project, every new project needs these three things. You're going to need a license, a good readme, and a contributing guide. So a license is what defines your project as open source. Without it, it's not an open source project. It's just public code that's subject to copyright. Um, that might sound obvious to some of you, but a, a lot of public projects on GitHub are actually not licensed. Um, if you're interested in licensing your projects, you can go to choosealicense.com, which is a microsite that we set up to help you pick a license. There's probably three or four that are pretty standard. Um, it's very easy to do. Readme is really important. It might sound intuitive that any open source project needs a readme, but it's not just about how to install your project or how to get started. But a readme is basically a marketing or landing page for your project. So it should explain why someone would use the project, what the project does, um, should communicate your roadmap, link to other documentation. Um, so it's much more than just how do I actually get started? And a lot of people miss that. And the third thing you'll need is a contributing guide which tells people how to contribute back to your project. So if the readme helps people get started with your project and use it, the contributing guide is basically a readme for people who want to contribute. And that'll have things like um, how do you actually file an issue, maybe has templates for people that want to file bugs, um, explains what the process is for getting a contribution accepted back into the project. All of those things are really important. So there's a running theme here around um, the importance of documentation. Documentation isn't just about uh, tutorials, examples, install instructions, but it's also things like if you're talking about your project with someone offline, taking those notes and putting them back online somewhere so that everyone can see them. Um, if someone opens an issue on your project and you have a discussion with someone about it offline, making sure that that conversation is somewhere documented in that issue and that the issue is kept updated. Um, basically, anything that's in your head should be down in writing somewhere. And it should, you should make it so that any new contributor has as much information or theoretically has access to as much information as you do as the maintainer and the originator of a project. And the other side of this is just the importance of making sure that your documentation is kept updated. So there's a tendency to write everything up front and do a really big documentation overhaul and then never look at it again. But policies obviously change over time. Um, people change over time, so it's just a matter of keeping all that fresh. Third thing that's really important, um, make good use of bots. Uh, you, the work behind maintaining your project doesn't just have to be human work. You can automate a lot of this stuff. So if you need to accept a contributor license agreement, you can have that automated. Um, if you need someone to figure out who the right person is to assign pull requests to someone else, that can be automated. Um, monitoring code coverage, automating releases, all that stuff, just don't even bother with it. Um, pass it on to something else. Um, I would also put testing into this. It's really important to set up testing so that um, nothing breaks when contributions are merged into a project. So um, all of that stuff, if, it's not, if it doesn't have to be human work, don't make it human work. Uh, the second area I'm going to look at is the importance of communicating expectations. Um, there are two areas within this that I think maintainers often miss in a project. Um, the first is the importance of being responsive. And the reason why responsiveness matters is that a fast response time vastly increases the chances that someone will make a repeat contribution. So if someone opens an issue or asks a question, don't let it linger for a month and then come back and say, oh, nice contribution, uh, can you make these changes? Because that person will probably never come back. Um, even if you don't have time to review it within 24 to 48 hours, it's important to at least say, hey, thanks for this contribution. Um, I'm going to look at it within the next week or so and get back to you. Um, even just that increases the chances that you've engaged a new contributor. Um, you can also create canned replies over time if you're getting the same requests for things. Um, you can put repeat questions into an FAQ or into your documentation. You don't have to always type everything um, from the start. Um, the other big area that I think maintainers miss is um, the importance of saying no to things. So if you have an open source project, inevitably someone is going to contribute something that you don't want to accept. Um, and the tendency is to just leave that issue open, ignore it, focus on something else. But that sends a negative response to your community 
because they're, they might not know why you didn't want to accept that contribution, but you do want to accept another one. It might make them less likely to open a new issue or people might start asking the same question and you're just ignoring it every time. So it's really important up front to just say, thank you for the contribution. This doesn't fit our scope or our policy. I'm going to close this issue and move on. Not doing this is how people end up with really big and unwieldy issue backlogs. Um, and again, documentation makes this easier to say no, because instead of saying, I don't like your contribution, you can say, this doesn't fit our process or our policy. Last year um, is the importance of leveraging your community. So a couple strategies within that. Um, the importance of sharing work with other people. And so this is actually kind of counterintuitive. Um, there, if, if you have something that's really easy to fix, don't fix it, let someone else fix it for you. So it might be tempting to say, there's an easy, non-critical bug, I can just kind of take care of that and uh, you know, one less thing in my issue queue. Um, but what you should actually do is leave it open and invite someone else from the community to fix it. Because the best way to get new contributors is to uh, have things like small website fixes, tutorials that need to be written, um, really small, easy bugs. Those are the things that actually get people contributing on a regular basis. And someone might start by fixing a small bug and become a regular contributor over time. It's much less likely that you're going to find a contributor who's going to write some amazing, amazing new feature requests and, uh, and suddenly you know, become really dedicated to your projects. So these are actually really great opportunities to um, get new people involved, even if upfront it feels counterintuitive or like a, a waste of your time. Um, and the last thing we're going to talk about is uh, just the importance of not tolerating bad actors. This ends up stressing out you as a maintainer over time because you're going to deal with a lot of rude or unhelpful people. Um, it keeps new people from contributing because they see how people talk to each other and they don't want to be a part of it. Um, people that are within your community might end up silently leaving or not contributing anymore. Um, this happens all the time in lots of different projects. And if you don't nip it early, um, it will just sort of like start to fester and, and, and make your community decline over time. Um, so ways to help enforce this are uh, code of conduct, which you can use a drop-in co uh, code of conduct like a uh, contributor covenant. So you just kind of copy paste into your project. Um, and, and also just being willing to actually moderate people's behavior and call it out when you see people saying things that um, just aren't really helpful or conducive to working together and collaborating. That's all I got. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to Austin. Hello, everyone. My name is Austin Collins. I'm the creator of the serverless framework, formerly known as JAWS, and also the CEO of a company uh, called Serverless Inc. <clears throat> uh, this presentation is about, um, I, I think Nadia gave a great talk about what you need for an open source project, what you need to kind of go to market with an open source project, which is a lot, because it's super competitive out there. And if you think you're just going to throw up some code and wing it, uh, and it's going to catch on and get serious traction, uh, you're crazy. Uh, it's the low, it's an environment with the lowest barriers to entry. Uh, anyone can put out open source stuff very, very easily. Uh, and you just have to check all those boxes to make sure you have everything you need. And my talk is going to be a bit about what happens after that. Once you ha what happens after you have an open source project that gets some traction? Uh, what are your next steps? How do you actually guide that project to success with a whole bunch of feedback? How do you, how do you hear your people, hear your users, um, and hear all the feature requests and criticism that they're giving you? Uh, anyway, so that's what this is about, learning how to optimize feedback uh, for open source projects, especially if you have little re uh, uh, little resources. Uh, a lot of open source projects aren't funded. They're just kind of side projects that people are doing. Um, and they don't have the data collection methodologies in place like a Netflix or an Amazon or a Google has. Uh, so I'm going to go over some scrappy solutions on, on how to do that. And then also uh, what, learn what pitfalls to avoid as you're trying to become a more data-informed open source project. Anyway, so a little over a year ago, I created this application framework. Um, used to be called JAWS, had a really cool shark icon and stuff. Uh, we rebranded like in November uh, 2015. It was kind of contingent on getting this uh, domain. But we switched over to the serverless framework. And 
I had put it up on Hacker News, and honestly, I didn't expect much from it because I figured it would just sink straight to the bottom, like 99.99% of all content posted to Hacker News. Uh, but I posted it, and I went out for a sandwich or something. I came back, it was on the front page. Number two position, tons of upvotes. And again, it was a rare day on Hacker News because all the comments were positive, which is a bit unusual. And uh, anyway, so all of a sudden, it was fantastic. It was, uh, everybody was excited. This, this application framework showed people that you could build entire applications on top of AWS Lambda, entire uh, serverless applications. Um, so that first day was great. And that was amazing to see the enthusiasm from the community, uh, from developers, the demand to want to wanna do this. Uh, but what happened the very next day uh, was a bit of a shock. So yeah, we hit about 1,000 GitHub stars in the first two days, by the way, um, which, is, which is pretty good for GitHub. But the next day, uh, I was happy. I, I woke up still feeling you know, really excited about the project and everything. Um, but I, I looked at the GitHub issues, and there were tons. Uh, I looked at the pull requests. There were tons already. And uh, I was immediately swamped with feedback and feature requests on all channels. Um, and by all channels, I mean so GitHub issues, GitHub pull requests. There were already thriving conversations going on in there. Um, and then comments were coming in on Twitter. People were emailing me. We had a Facebook page. People were sending comments to the Facebook page. Uh, we already had a Stack Overflow tag. People were sending com uh, writing Stack Overflow issues. Um, there were a lot of private conversations. I was talking to people on the phone. They had feedback. And so all of a sudden, it was like this breakout success. And then everybody had an opinion as to what we should do next and where we guide the project, which is a lot, because uh, I didn't have much when I started this whole thing. Um, so that was, that was a bit overwhelming. But I saw in that data, um, there's a ton of value there. And I could see all these comments and these requests and stuff. I mean, all that is really good. That's, you know, such a, we're so, so fortunate to have all that stuff coming in. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't really access it. It was just too much noise. And I couldn't really read a strong signal. People were just kind of knee-jerk reaction, throwing stuff out. Uh, as to what they felt they needed and stuff like that. Um, and I wanted to kind of improve that process uh, and do it in a way that would be kind of quick and easy to implement. Um, so <clears throat> fortunately, we, we scaled up a, a team over the past year. Uh, we have about 10 people working on the framework right now. Uh, and we've, we've stumbled a, a bit in trying to collect our feedback and optimize our data collection process. And here's a, here's a couple big pitfalls uh, we stumbled into as we started. Uh, so first off, we kind of thought we were collecting feedback and we were taking stuff from Twitter and everywhere and writing it down. And I don't know, this was a bit of like the illusion of motion, uh, I think. And what, what happened was like we weren't tracking it well. We weren't you know, saying this many people requested this feature. Um, and we didn't have any charts or anything like that. And what happened was we had this broken feedback process, which honestly was more harmful than it was good. Uh, because everybody would say, oh, I saw so-and-so say this on Twitter, and I think that we should do this thing next. And someone would say, oh, but look at this GitHub issue. It has lots of comments. I think we should do this thing next. And uh, so if you don't have that process in place, like something a little bit more formal, uh, I'd say be wary of it, because it's very susceptible to bias, I think. People just look at something. Someone on your team looks at something, and they say, oh, no, no, this is, this is the priority. And you're just going to get a team that's very misaligned. Um, next up, something you have to be aware of is that just, just bad feedback. Uh, and it was, uh, it's everywhere, even from smart people. And it's not because they are unintelligent people. It's just because they don't understand the entirety of the project. Um, they don't really align with where you think the project should go. Um, or they're just some Hacker News commenter who says, you know, this project sucks. Don't worry about those people. Um, and then lastly, uh, a big, I didn't realize, as we, as we moved along and we started to optimize our data collection process um, and things started to become a bit more clear, our signal started to become clearer, uh, I didn't know that the, the side effect of all that was that <clears throat> your, uh, the intuition and the instincts and the experience and that, that vision uh, that kind of guided me and guided some of the earlier contributors um, as to how, to how to guide the framework would get demoted and the data would become more favorable, um, which, is, which is a bit hard. Uh, it just causes a cultural shift. It's a bit different and it's something you have to be aware of, whereas uh, I think that the data is 
important, um, but you can't follow it all the time. I think that you should always kind of follow your instincts and experience and try to be data informed instead of data driven. Uh, because data can sometimes be misleading too. So you have to kind of prepare for this cultural shift where everyone says, uh, yeah, I know you, you did this and we made it this far, but we really want to, all the data is pointing in this direction and you're thinking like, I don't know, maybe it should go in this direction. So that's, that's a delicate balance um, you have to be wary of as you, as you go down this path. So scrappy solutions, so how did we actually fix this problem? Uh, number one, boring surveys. Boring surveys are awesome. Uh, they're so fantastic. And uh, again, when you have all this feedback coming in from every single channel, um, this feedback is just kind of little tiny bits of information without, like a, without any context. Uh, and I think the first thing that the survey does really well is that it forces all the people giving feedback to really look at the project uh, as a whole and chime in as to, you know, once they look at all the things that we want to do, then they kind of filter their request into the context of all that stuff. Um, and as a result, I think you get a much stronger signal. Um, and again, just, it just really clarifies what people want. Uh, also, you get information as to who the people are, uh, which is invaluable, because you always want to know, you know what type of person is requesting what feature. Um, so Google surveys, this is all we use now. Uh, and I wish that we did this from day one. Uh, honestly, like this is the scrappiest, uh, best ROI solution um, that we implemented. Uh, so yeah, Google surveys are great. Also, I think that you should have a survey right in the beginning with your open source project. Uh, and as your open source project evolves, I would also iterate on that survey. Because uh, again, it's just invaluable. And uh, you can see at the top, it's a really small graphic, but there's um, uh, that pie chart at the top is how, many of our, how much experience our users have with Amazon Web Services, um, which is great because we could see the summary of all the responses and we could say, oh, this is interesting, 25% of all of our users have really never used Amazon Web Services before. Like, this is, uh, this is really interesting data. Um, and then whereas half have over two years of experience. Uh, so that's really fascinating. Uh, additionally, you could see there's just, we listed out a whole bunch of features of what we'd like to do next. People can just uh, upvote the stuff that they want. Uh, and that's a very clear signal. Uh, also, the Google survey, it, pre it presents everything in a really accessible format. Um, and I'll talk about the value of just having stuff visually presented uh, nicely in just a second. Um, so anyway, surveys clarify what people want. The next thing that we did is that we actually put tracking uh, in the open source project. Um, it was a very, it was kind of a controversial decision. We debated it for months and months, and we did a lot of research, and we realized that most popular open source projects now actually have some type of tracking in them. Um, and this was kind of a revelation for us. Uh, so we decided to do it because, again, we're just swamped by feedback on all channels. And we want to make sure that we're really building something that people want. That's what matters most to us. So we have, uh, we have tracking uh, in the framework, and it really clarifies what people are doing already. So the surveys clarify what people are asking for. Uh, the tracking clarifies what people are actually doing at the end of the day, which is invaluable data. Um, and again, so we did this, we're trying to be as transparent as possible. We talk about the tracking. We make it really easy to opt out if you want to opt out. Uh, we don't really capture what we think is sensitive information. We just want to know what commands you're running. So the framework is just a CLI tool uh, written in Node.js, and we just want to know what, what people are using it more, uh, mostly for. Um, so we try to be transparent as possible, but honestly, this, this really helps. Uh, lastly, a single dashboard to view everything. Um, so we have, uh, it's a chart IO is what we're using. Uh, we have all our data pouring into there. We know how many deployments people are doing, uh, what commands they're running, of course. Um, I think this is for our latest version of the framework. People have run about almost 300,000 commands just in the last, that might be like a, a weekly number. And um, ugh, it's just invaluable. So once you optimize the data collection, you clarify what people want. You clarify what people are actually doing. Uh, you have to get that data and put it in a dashboard. If the data is not accessible, if it's not visible, visible, uh, easily visible um, to your entire team, it's, it's totally worthless. And again, people are just kind of perusing notes or something like that that are disorganized, and they're kind of making uh, assumptions that may be incorrect, and you're just going to get more misaligned uh, as a team. So super important. Uh, these three things are so effective. Uh, honestly, we kind of, you know, we look at Twitter, we look at the GitHub issues and all that stuff, but this is what we look at uh, first and foremost. So highly recommend it. Uh, right now for the tracking, uh, what we've set up is just a segment, uh, which is storing events every time someone does something with the command line interface. 
Uh, it's being sent up to Segment, stored in Redshift, uh, and it goes right over to Chart.io. Um, and then we're using Google surveys. We're very much looking forward to just setting up a single Lambda function uh, with a REST API endpoint that receives uh, all the activity that uh, all the commands people are running, saves it in DynamoDB. We could use the new QuickSight dashboard, uh, which looks fantastic um, on top of all this to prepare our dashboard, and then probably just Google surveys because they're so darn simple, and simple is always the best solution. Other tips uh, that we learned. Um, when something is great, users always say so. They're like, you could look at it, and people are talking about it. Uh, when something is, is not so great or something is bad, uh, many users won't say, won't say anything. Uh, and I've become uh, very sensitive about this as we, as we go along. Uh, and I think just people don't care. They look at something, they don't have time. They're like, this doesn't, this doesn't fit my need. They're not going to go around writing all this uh, negative feedback or uh, writing all this criticism uh, immediately. They probably just don't want to put that out there. They don't have a lot of time again at the end of the day. So. Uh, again, I, I always ask my team, I say, like, is this working? And the team kind of shrugs, and they're like, oh, I don't know. It's, I, think, I think it looks good. And I say, no, 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 point me to a place where people are actually talking about it. Um, so uh, again, uh, and then once, and I, I learned this because once we fix the thing, uh, everybody starts talking about it. And then we go, ah, it actually was broken uh, at the end of the day. So, and then again, the, the other big lesson is just to be data informed, uh, not data driven. Um, I love data. It's important, uh, especially because you don't want to miss something big, uh, and the data will really help you uh, be aware of something that you might be missing. It's kind of like an insurance policy. Um, but I'm also a big fan of intuition uh, and instincts and experience. Um, at the end of the day, nobody was asking for an application framework uh, to build apps exclusively on Lambda um, when I started this project. There was no data around for that. and. Um, and yeah, it was just something I wanted uh, to scratch my own itch. Um, and it ended up having a, having a big impact. So anyway, uh, be careful. Balance these things as best you can. Uh, and that's about it. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Andy uh, from Netflix. Hey, good job, man. Thank you. Wow, hello. My name's Andy. I'm from Netflix. I run Delivery Engineering. We, uh, I was going to say recently, but it's been over a year now. We open sourced a project called Spinnaker, and it's, uh, it's leveraged a lot of the lessons learned from um, many years of open sourcing in Netflix. So I'm here to tell you about how Netflix open sources. It's going to build on the, the awesome things that Nadia and Austin said. In fact, it's all additive. And uh, we'll just get started. So as I said, Netflix, as I said, I'm from Netflix. We went to the cloud, obviously AWS, uh, almost seven years ago. And in the process of doing so, we wrote a ton of software. And we ultimately decided to open source almost all of it. In fact, at that time, Adrian was part of Netflix and was uh, instrumental in some of those decisions. And we, uh, we elected to open source everything that wasn't proprietary or offered some sort of competitive advantage. So all the software for, let's say, you know, uh, discovery, uh, how we manage our cloud, um, IPC, all of that software that we wrote that ultimately doesn't necessarily differentiate Netflix from many of our competitors, we open sourced. And we learned quite a few lessons. But first and foremost, before I get to the lessons, I want to kind of describe the culture at Netflix and how we open source and our goals of open sourcing. I imagine some of you are also at big companies that are looking at how to open source. And again, everything I'm going to say here is additive to the awesome tips that Nadia and Austin just provided. But first and foremost, at Netflix, uh, we have a strong cultural mantra of freedom and responsibility. And so there is no centralized open source team at Netflix. Every team in Netflix is free to open source whatever they want so long as it's not a, uh, you know, a proprietary competitive advantage thing. So you'll notice almost all open source software at Netflix has something to do with like infrastructure, how we manage infrastructure, how we manage data, or something like that. Uh, you won't find, for example, uh, encoding stuff, or how we you know, stream video, or our, our uh, particular UI, or something like that. But the key thing is that it's up to every team to open source whatever they want, so long as it fits those guidelines. There's no you know, open source Zara. You don't have to get permission to open source something. There are some centralized teams that can help with open sourcing, i.e., 
Uh, there is a legal team, so you can go to them and say, hey, you know, we want to open source this. Let's talk about licensing. Is this, you know, something that you feel, i.e., you know, legal? Do you feel this is a competitive advantage thing and whatnot? So the, and that's up to you to go to legal. Um, you can also go to centralized resources for if you want a logo or if you want help building a website or something like that. But at the end of the day, you open source what you want to open source, and you own it. And that, that, that'll be key in a second. So why do we open source? If it's not a competitive advantage, if, you know, it, what's the point of open sourcing? So at a company like Netflix, and I imagine other companies in this area, and I imagine for GitHub and, and serverless and everyone else out there, the number one reason to open source is for hiring. When we open source our software, that means if you use it, you're familiar with our, with our software, and it makes it easier for me to potentially hire you. In fact, I just ma recently made a hire, and the individual was familiar with the platform that my team builds, Spinnaker, because they were using it at their company. And so, lo and behold, we get an employee who's already familiar with our technology stack, who's excited about it because he's been working on it in, you know, in the open source world, and he's now a valuable you know, employee of Netflix. And that's, that's one story of many, many. There are other projects like RxJava, um, even previous projects like Asgard, or even you know, current ones like Falcor. Um, those are huge recruiting engines. You have a, a community you can tap, and I'll get into some lessons learned there in a minute, but at the end of the day, if you have an open source project and you do everything that Nadia and Austin talked about in terms of fostering it, you'll develop a community, and at the end of the day, that community is potentially someone you can tap to work with you or for you. The second reason why we open source software is ultimately for validation, industry validation. Um, you know, we, we, we open source a lot of our infrastructure management and facilitation platforms and tools when a community starts using it and providing feedback, it's, it's validation that we're doing something right. Um, as, kind of, as, as, as Austin was kind of pointing out, the, the lack of a signal is a signal in and of itself. I.e., if you open source something and no one touches it, no one's interested, that's a signal. Maybe you're doing the wrong thing. Maybe there's a better solution out there. But at the end of the day, the, the, what you really want is to get the validation that, hey, we're doing something interesting someone else finds valuable, and then they can you know, maybe provide some feedback and build a, a more credible, maybe val you know, valid solution. So it's about recruiting and then validation. Are we doing the right thing? Is, are, 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 you know, do we have blinders on? Are we thinking kind of just crazily and not recognizing you know, greater trends in the industry and whatnot? As I said, Netflix went to the cloud about seven years ago, open sourced a lot of software, and we have learned uh, numerous lessons, and, and some that are, again, building on the, uh, the lessons they've talked about, but I have some other ones as well. And remember, the first reason to open source software, at least from a big corporation standpoint, is for recruiting. But there's a, there's a nuance there. Uh, you, <laughs> you do not want to kill the goose that lays the golden egg, i.e., you will have people in the community that are, let's say they become contributors um, from other big companies, maybe you have partnerships, it's very, very tempting to say, hey, you know, Lisa, you are awesome. You're committing all this code. Come work for Netflix. It turns out maybe Lisa works for you know, a, a partner of yours or a big company, or maybe Lisa is one of many people on a team that are you know, investing in what you've open sourced. And once you poach her, you send the wrong signal, or you could potentially send the wrong signal. So the key thing is, is while it's great for recruiting, you, you have to kind of be careful who you go after. Don't necessarily go after the people that are, if you do have a, a thriving open source project and you have corporate interests and you have money pouring into it, may not want to you know, go after those people, uh, or at least you may not want to go after them. Now they may c come to you and say, hey, really like this project you're working on at Netflix. I I'd like to talk about opportunities at Netflix. Of course, I'm willing to have that conversation and anyone at Netflix is, is willing to have that. But the, the nuance is, is I won't, or we won't necessarily go after you. Now, there are people in the periphery of the community that maybe are using your software that are, are fair game. But the people that are investing in these open source projects, I would, I would be leery poaching them, uh, at least without having a conversation maybe with the other corporation that's potentially uh, in par you're in partnership with. And I can't stress this enough. Nadia and, and Austin did the same thing. Um, 
you, you know, that if you build it, they will come. It worked in a movie. That's the only time it ever worked. In open source, you have to nurture the community. You can't just throw something out there and expect, you know, it'll be on, you know, uh, Hacker News and just be amazing. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a once in a lifetime event. Uh, and once it happens, you have to nurture it. You have to, a, a, as everyone said, monitor PRs, uh, look at issues, all your channels, you have to actually engage with the community. And in fact, that was a big lesson we learned at Netflix is occasionally we would open source something and not necessarily nurture that community. And so in fact, we built tooling to facilitate this. So when you open source something at Netflix, we have, an, we have a, a framework that will essentially monitor your GitHub, uh, your GitHub site. It'll, it'll tell you how many open PRs you have. It'll tell you how many open issues you have. Um, and it'll stack rank it against every other open source project at Netflix. And so it's kind of this uh, almost like a competition, like, hey, by the way, uh, Joe, your, your, your open source project is the worst. Maybe you should do something about it. Uh, or maybe your project's the best. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, so we have built tooling to help facilitate, you know, kind of around the dashboards, as Austin was talking about, that visibility in terms of you have to nurture a community. Uh, if you don't, as, as Nadia pointed out, if, if someone submits an issue and you don't say anything for a while, it sends a bad signal. It was great advice in terms of saying, hey, we, we can't get to this now, but thank you very much. And I can't also stress saying no is very important. Uh, just leaving it hanging. Again, we've done that at Netflix with some older open source projects. It sends a terrible message. This one is key, especially for the project that my team maintains, is engaging your community and looking for partnerships. The key thing here is understanding that, you know, that when you say no, uh, a nuance there is understanding what you won't do. As a corporation, we don't make money for open source. Uh, the, the software we throw out there, again, it's only for recruiting uh, and industry validation. So if I don't make any money on it, then I'm not necessarily motivated to make you know, certain features. However, the community may want those features, so you can you can engage partners. So in the case of, uh, of Spinnaker, we went out and we engaged some major corporations and said, hey, we're going to build this platform. It's going to work amazingly well with AWS, but we'd like it to work with other platforms as well. And those corporations stepped up and we engaged. And we figured out as a team, here are the things we're going to do and here are the things we're not going to do. And then we asked those partners, do you want to do these? For example, there's, an open, there's, a, uh, there's a consulting company called Kenzan that we partnered with and we said, hey, could you make Spinnaker easy to install? because that's not something that Netflix is really going to focus on because we've already installed it. We don't need to necessarily make it really easy because we don't have to install it that often. Uh, so engage partners. If you, if you can build a community, if you can build some interests, then go out there and, and talk to them, ask them what they need, and then ask them to do it. And invariably, some of your partners, they may have a financial interest in the open source. You may not, but they may, and that may be their motivation to end up doing some work for you, i.e. Uh, for example, with, with another major corporation that we partner with, they, they uh, in fact, I'll get there right now. Another large corporation that we're working with has begun adding some key features into our platform around authorization. And, and the best part is, is now we get to use it. So if you can engage a community, foster a community, then you get this third benefit that is not even, it, it, it's you get innovation. And it's not something we go out to get when we open source. It's kind of, you're lucky if you get it. But people will innovate on your open source software, on your platforms, on your tools, and you get to take advantage of it. It's like free development. Again, the major corporation is adding uh, authorization, uh, an authorization kind of uh, framework inside of our platform that Netflix is going to make use of. There are multiple PRs that we've accepted from outside community, whether it be an individual or a corporation, that employees at Netflix are leveraging today. And that's awesome. That is a success, a success. But that's only because we did the other things up front in terms of managing a community, engaging a community, not poaching from the community, uh, and, and trying to keep that, you know, that community thriving. So again, the reason if you're a big company and you're open sourcing, Ultimately, at least in Netflix's case, is for recruiting, and it's a great engine. We hire countless people through this, this vehicle, so to speak. Second, it's validation. Are we even doing the right thing? Are there other trends out in the industry that we're missing? Or are we actually creating those trends? 
And then lastly, this one is not, an, this is, is, a, is very much an, a kind of an, a covert or you know, uh, indirect goal, but if you can do these things well, you get innovation out of it. And this is huge, because this is free development, so to speak, leveraging innovation from outside communities that you can make use of. As it was already pointed out, um, having kind of a corporate presence uh, is important, having a, you know, a well-shepherded uh, website where people can get information. So in the case of Netflix, we, we have netflix.github.io. If you go there, it's a centralized page. It describes everything we offer. Uh, and then links off to individual sites. And in the case of my team's project, uh, we built our own website. It's, called, it's on spinnaker.io. Excuse me, spinnaker uh, obviously, all the code is on GitHub. But as you can see, a key thing to fostering a community, as, as was already pointed out, is you know, communication, documentation, videos. Uh, all those things are present on this website, uh, as well as links into our Slack channel, how to get, you know, create issues on GitHub and whatnot. That's spinnaker.io. So that's all I have. We, have. we are going to take questions now. So Nadia, Austin, come on up. Thank you.